right, welcome back to the podcast. My guest this week is Maddie Stone, a security researcher in Google Project Zero. Maddie's focused a lot on uh, uh, tracking ODA's exploited in the wild recently. Prior to that, did some work on the Android team, uh, doing mobile security research. Maddie, welcome to the show. Looking forward to a fun conversation. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, can we let's start on the OD year in review piece that you guys just published? You've been doing this tracking the discovery of OD in the wild, not necessarily tracking all OD in the wild, that's impossible, but tracking the discovery and documentation of OD in the wild for the last three years. When you look at, right, you've done it for 18, uh, 19, 20, 21. Yeah, so I, Project Zero has kept track since mid-2014, but I have been working on this program since um Right, the specific, the specific yeah. tracking of the end of while OD for over the three years. Is there a one big trend that pops out to you from the last three years of data that tells you what? Um, last three years, you're, we're starting off tough here. Okay. If one yeah, thing because I, I want to I wanna put the whole thing into context, right? And yeah. start to see, cause, because the whole idea is to start collecting this data so we can start seeing patterns. Unless, and, and this is like earliest stage, even three years is early, early stage, right? Yeah. So I think the biggest thing we can take away is that I think there's more use of zero day exploits than I think a lot of us in the industry wanted to talk about. And that the use of these zero day exploits or these zero day exploits that are being used are not quite as technically sophisticated as we all like to make them out to be. They're not this once in a lifetime requires such extreme knowledge, expertise, and time to put in that actually it looks a lot like things we've seen in public. So I think that's really what we've seen thus far in the last three years. But that tells us also that they don't need to, right? They don't need to be ultra sophisticated. A handful of sophisticated ones, are, there, there are a handful, you can count it on one hand, it's the ones that are really, really technically, you know, the marvel at the technical brilliance of some of these things. But the fact that there's, it's same old, same old, what does that tell, say about like just defense in general or the state of computing in your mind? So I actually, I know like to jump in, it sounds like my answer would be of, this is really sad. We should be doing so much better. Like what's going on? But I actually think there's a positive side of this is that I would say when I started this work three years ago, you know, most people would say, oh, we can't worry about zero days. There's nothing we can ever do to stop them, make it harder, have people use them less. But what the data is showing us is actually there's a lot of very clear things that if we put effort into it as an industry, we actually can make this much more difficult for attackers to be able to have these zero days and use them less often. So I think knowing that, oh, this isn't this thing we've never seen before studying attack surface that aren't even on our radars it shows us wait actually if we do put the investment into these types of solutions that you know the industry has been talking about for years it's very likely we will make get a real um, return back on those types of efforts uh, let, uh, let me seg to you mentioned making it day hard. Let me seg. That's kind of like the Google project mission mantra over the years. You know, our mission yeah. is to make day hard. And through this mm -hmm. kind of sharing of research and pointing out where science are. We. At the end of your blog post, you say, as an industry, we're not making it day hard. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you mentioned incremental improvement and things getting better and you can see things getting better but at the same time OD is not hard the data shows it how do you balance that in your mind well so yes the project zero mission since it was founded in mid 2014 is make zero day hard um what does so that I mean let's 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 linger there for okay. a second what in your yeah. mind what does that mean so it's i don't think there is one clear definition of what hard looks like. So what I'm actually really focused on is those incremental improvements of what does it mean to make it harder? Because I think those are things we can actually track and get behind versus this, you know, one point in the future that, you know, no one can super define right now. So what harder looks like it, to me is that whatever capabilities attackers want, that doesn't just mean zero days. It takes them more effort. It's more costly for them to maintain requires more expertise and resources. So an example of that is, you know, like 
five, 10 years ago, you could pop a lot of desktop computers, um, you know, or mobile phones without even using a zero day. Right. So, you know, that's the first step is that people could be hacked and owned without ever needing to use one of these zero day exploits. So the fact now that in a lot of cases, they're required, that is, an, that is an incremental improvement in security. So then when we're talking making zero day hard or harder, that looks like now today, you don't just need one of those zero days, like to own, say, an Android device. You generally need three zero days chained together. So you can't just go and say, I found a zero day vulnerability and I'm going to figure out how to exploit it. You now have to do that three times. So that's what, to me, make zero day harder means. It means that you can't plug and play and using the same exploit met methodology and just put another vulnerability in it. It's every time one of your capabilities are caught, burned, patched, you have to start from scratch. Right. So you're and adding cost, adding resources, and just kind of raising the bar and raising the cost for the attackers. But at the same time, yeah. at the same time, right? The, the state of play is if you go to Tianfu Cup or Pwn to Own, everything still gets owned, right? Every modern device yeah. still gets owned. They, they, if, I've been covering Pwn to Own for 10, 15 years. Charlie Miller used to show up and pop an iPhone with one single memory corruption bug. Today, those guys need four or five. So your data, it's clear. It's clear that we've made it harder. Mm -hmm. But even at harder, we're still, I mean, I'm, I'm a cynic, right? So I'm going to. Uh, full disclosure, we're still nowhere near protecting ourselves. We have a ransomware epidemic. We have, everything seems to be owned at a, at a time when, you know, the security research community feels like we're moving the bar forward. And when I talk to CISOs and defenders, they feel helpless. So I, I'm trying to balance, like, where are we? So, and I think that's sort of combining two different issues there. So ransomware, in a lot of cases, they're not even using zero Correct. days. And that's so my that point. Is a different, yeah, that is a different level um, of security that most organizations, if you have not covered the bare minimum of, you know, good security practices, you'll get compromised. Then probably focusing on zero day exploits is not where your resources should go yet. Because the whole goal is you want to make it as hard as possible for attackers to get into your systems. They shouldn't just be like, oh, well, they weren't that high value of a target, but it's easy peasy. So like, why not throw them into the bucket? That's sort of the goal of this zero day is hard. And when we look at, you know, the known zero day exploitation, and I don't think we know a lot of what's going on. I still think we only know a small percentage. In the scheme of things, it's not everyone is getting pwned with zero days. And so in that sense, I think we need to sort of remember that yes, someone will always find a way into um, devices. What we want it to be is that they've put in so many resources and it is so special, so precious, and so rare for them to have this capability that they use it with so much discretion that they don't get a lot of return out of it. They may only use it on their one, two, or three top targets versus, you know, say in a watering hole where there's a good chance, you know, some other people will stumble upon it, find it, and burn their zero days. When we're seeing that sort of lackadaisical attitude of, I'm going to use these zero days with discretion, that's a very clear indicator that, you know, zero day is absolutely not hard enough um, and that we need to keep working on and focusing on this mission. But as we see things get more targeted, I think that's also an indicator that like, okay, these are becoming more of a precious resource um, to attack. I remember all chatter of zero day and O day in the wild O day used to be the, you know, the forte of nation state attackers, it, apex predators with unlimited resources. That has changed. Cyber criminals, ransomware guys, uh, uh, just, you know, uh, access brokers and all these subsets of the ransomware ecosystem are using OD. Like OD is now accessible to a larger, or maybe we're now visualizing it. Maybe it's always been accessible. But in a lot of your, a lot of the OD reporting, it's no longer the forte of like apex predators. So the vulnerability seems to have filtered down. Is that fair? Um, so I don't actually know of last year, like many, if, any, I think there might have been one or two that 
we believe were affiliated with ransomware. But but, but in fairness, that, you're like, not covering all of them back. either. I mean, we should we should make that we should kind of set the the, the parameters around it. Your OD spreadsheet only looks at things that Project Zero is interested in. Can you kind of help, help me explain the scope of your OD thing? Yeah. So the scope that we focus on, um, which is defined like. We have a tracking spreadsheet so everyone can see the data that we're working off of um, and, you know, do peer review and things like that because more eyes, eyes and brains on this topic is better. But we have scoped it to largely the large consumer products, large um, geographically diverse products around the global. So we don't really include any IoT devices. We don't th include zero days like against Word. Um, press plugins VPNs or VPNs you know, and Axelion and some. That's why I'm, that's why I'm saying your if your data is not showing crimeware groups using Oday, it's because maybe you're not you know you're not looking at the places they are using Oday, which is on these VPNs and network appliances and that kind of thing. I think it's also important to think of like so the data and the reason why we track it is to also be able to assess over time what types of trends and changes, and so also focusing on things that are sort of in the same groups as each other so that your scope from year to year to year can be um, similar. And like we've added new things in since mid 2014 when Ben started first privately tracking. Ben was um, one of the original TLs of Project Zero. And he announced um, so his he departure from Project Zero today. Good yes, luck and congratulations sad, to Ben. Yes, but congratulations um, to him. So he So to keep that scope and also focusing on things that we believe we can and can put resources into hopefully making a difference in in zero day is hard because if you think about it you know like an application that doesn't have a security team behind it or iot devices that will never do security updates trying to prevent zero days on those is a very different um problem, problem than presenting trying to make zero day harder for chrome and android and ios so Yes, our scope is different than maybe, you know, every zero day on there. We also, there's been like some zero days named as DOS attacks or their DOS right, vulnerabilities. Right. And so we don't really use those because they're not the same problem and they're generally not used in the same way with the same societal impacts as, you know, zero days um, that are coming from commercial surveillance vendors or targeting, you know, Windows machines and enterprises in that respect. The, the raw numbers are going up. The first year, I believe in 2020, your tracking had 25 up to 28 in 20. And all the, last year, your tracker detected and it's documented a detection and disclosure of 58 in the wild days, right? The okay. number is climbing. Yeah. Yes. This is not a number of, this number isn't climbing of how many zero days actually in the wild. This is how much we've actually detected and disclosed. Are we? better at finding exactly. them or are they using more is the volume so, so high that it's just bubbling up to the top or are the tools and people and all these things just better at ferreting out these things so i go into more detail in this blog post you referenced the year in review but when looking at the data my perspective in project zeros is that it's this uptick from 2020 to 2021 is not solely and can't really be explained by a higher use of zero days what it looks like is a lot there's a lot more detection and disclosure because while i say we track zero days used in the wild we can only track things that we right. know about and unfortunately attackers don't really want to come to me and say hey i'm using this zero day you haven't caught it yet but hey give me credit where credit's due <laughs> if they want to i would love that but so far that hasn't been um how this is going and so not only do they have to be found and detected in the wild which is a hard problem but then we need the industry to be public about the dis public about the fact that this isn't just another zero day vulnerability, say found by a fuzzer or something like this. There is evidence to support that it is being actively exploited in the wild. And so that's where I think the numbers come from, not the use, but the detection and the public knowledge of them being zero day. And the reason why I feel somewhat confident saying it's more of this latter part is because even in 2021, it's the first full year that we had Android and Apple 
actually labeling in their security bulletins that um, when they have evidence to. Or oh, it's terrible labeling, though, right? This, this, uh, there, there is a report that this may have been exploited in the wild. Like some of the phrasing and stuff, it's just. Uh, anyway, we have to get better at that. That's not a conversation I, for I, here. I mean, yes. 100%, but I'm also going to take the win that at least they're being that. labeled. Because, yeah, because we didn't know about all these in previous Yeah, years. your own company does and the so, same thing too. I mean, talk to your Android team as well, because a lot of the times you'll see a Chrome bug or an Android bug coming out of it, and the documentation is so vague, you don't even know. And then, anyway, that's not a conversation for now. <laughs> uh, you, you, it's clear that we are better at finding. It's clear that the tools are better. The EDR guys have figured out how to do their logging and finding and tracking. Researchers are better. Project Zero is amazing. Everything is better. But are we good enough? No. And I would continue to say no because also it keeps me in a job, but that's not my sole reason of saying Right. No. So it's, if, if we're not good enough then, right? And let's say, yeah. what percentage do you think we see? What is the percentage you think we've found? Do you think this is in the range of what we see in this 58 last year is 5% uh, of everything, 20% of everything? Which bucket do you see that? So I, I feel like with 95% confidence saying less than 20%, less than 20%. and probably like 75% um, confidence less than 10%. Um, even when we just look at the ones we found, like I mentioned earlier, that most times if attackers want a capability to hack into someone's phone or device, they're going to have to chain multiple zero days. And so when we look at the zero days we found, we find a lot of those first steps, for example. So say the first render remote code execution vulnerability for a browser. But the next step after that has to be a sandbox escape most of the time or a local privilege escalation, and we're not finding those as much. And it makes sense because once you get that first step, there's often, you know, types of obfuscation, it's all hidden, right? fingerprinting, you know, attackers don't want to just hand over their zero days to um, us researchers. So wait a second, so wait <laughs> so, a second, you're saying that for every O day that gets popped, that, that gets, that gets this detected and disclosed and documented, there's potentially two or three or four as part of the stitched chain that R zero day, but we'll never know about, and they keep that in their arsenal, right? I mean, I believe I, I believe Mark Dowd explained this on his on a podcast recently about when a when a bug dies, what happens. So you're saying it could be twenty percent of what we're finding, right? Yeah, I would feel very confident saying we're seeing less than twenty percent of what's out there. I think if you know use a broader scope of what you, zero day means right. or like things, I would say it's even lower. Um, but in terms of the um, targets we focus on. How do we double more. that? Definitely. What needs to be fixed? Is it the tools? Is it better people looking? Is it more people looking? What, how do we get that number from 20% to say 40%? So I think what's really hard in this area, and it's something that I've been struggling with, is that all of our quantifiable metrics generally, in terms of percentage effectiveness, they're yeah, all yeah, They're made up, right. They're, I mean, they're we're leaning on expertise and conversations and collaborations and things like that to come up, but we will never have a sure right. answer. And so that's where focusing on those numbers is hard. The things I think we can do to improve it is one as an industry leaning into more transparency um, because uh, there's a, when a zero day is detected in the wild, that is the failure case for attackers. They really don't want us to detect it, fix the bug, because they no, they no longer have that thing. But we're not able to capitalize, and I say we as, industry. as the whole industry can, because samples aren't shared or technical details aren't shared or things like that. And I know, like, even from our point side, like, transparency on some of these things is really stinking hard because you also don't want to lose your ability to find the next step or things like that. But if we're not, you know, fit, creating an exploit mitigation for e every exploit technique, if we're not all sharing that, okay, these are generally who these actors are targeting right now, if, which is not really my area since I'm not a threat intel person, but, you know, across the board, being able to share all this information to protect those who are generally harmed with zero days, like 
I think that's where we will see the biggest improvement. And obviously more resources going into zero day detection, especially I think from um, vendor teams, because they'll generally have the most access, telemetry, things like that. Um, Can we link? I think back. Can we linger a, bit, a little what? bit on the transparency piece? Because you, you mentioned it as one of the conclusions mm -hmm. and recommendations in the blog. It's kind of calling for an industry yep. standard behavior from all vendors around public disclosure when there's evidence to suggest vulnerability is exploited in a way. In your mind, what does best practices around disclosure look like? Like, what, what would be a perfect case scenario that balances that need for, you know, transparency? And not giving up total visibility into what you have. Because there's, like you just mentioned, there's that balance between le not letting them know everything that you know. And so what does it look like in your mind? Is it, is it like standard phrasing in, 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 in vulnerable reports? What, what would that look like? So I think, I think there's a lot of different ways. Like I'm not even at the perfect best practices stage yet. I would just even okay, like, so a what's, yes an, no what's an incremental next step business. that would, that would make us a little happy. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, um, Chrome, Microsoft, Adobe, um, and some others for years and years, if they had reason to believe something was exploited in wild, whether that was internal to themselves or a researcher reported and told them that, they would use different phrasing across the board to to signal to the industry there's some exploitation known, happens, right um, yeah and so like Microsoft's is they just have a field on all of theirs that says yes, exploited yeah. question mark yes or no you know um, we've talked a little bit about like Chrome's language versus Apple language Android language so if we can get that now across the industry as a standard like I'm almost sort of like whatever language you want to use just give us an indicator to know there's some evidence as a well, but, but when you, what do you mean by an indicator that, just 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 language just basic language that it's been exploited or you're talking about an indicator that helps the rest of us go look for signs of it ourselves so i will even just take the binary yes or no reason because so at this point you're yet. just you're That's just advocating for baby steps so at this point let's not get too excited because we need to have these baby steps there's just too much yeah, yeah, I mean, that's the fact that we cannot be confident for so many large vendors in this industry that they're telling us even yes or no, this vulnerability, there's reason to believe it's exploited in the wild. Like, that's something that I think should be a very basic, you know. Should um, be an expectation. It should be minimal, a minimal expectation. Minimal I mean, and, and, and I argue that, that defenders and buyers, people who are buying these technologies should be demanding this at a minimum uh, as part of their buying practices. Yeah, and that's 100% what I was um, trying and have been trying to advocate for. And I also, talking to vendors, I understand why it's hard for them. And so that's where it's baby steps. But also as an industry, anytime there is that notation that something's exploited in the wild, press for these vendors when they admit that tends to be pretty terrible it tends to be oh no you know the product a is so hackable another zero day in the wild um and so they're like hey we got a way less bad press before all of this yeah, was Maddie, public, I, we but that's a sign of maturity it. though it's only an immature organization that looks at the fixed bug and sees that as something negative every bug that gets fixed your product is better the next day immediately I mean, the, the idea that you fixed an old yeah. day and it's a negative thing, I don't, I think that's a sign of like immaturity on their side, not understanding that there's a certain sophistication among buyers that a fix is a better thing. And I completely agree with you, but I, I'm coming from the point of how, how do we get these changes? And so understanding where each of these right. vendors are to help maybe make that transition easier. So it's easier for them to do the thing we really want as security professionals. Um, and so like another step that I think is super helpful and I hope that we see more of is um, where, especially in these open source products, especially browsers, open source engines, Chromium, Firefox, WebKit, the ability to tie back a CVE to like, what was the patch that was fixed? So we have some understanding of what's the vulnerability. Um, and so like Apple this year for the first time started um, in their release notes for WebKit, which is the browser engine Safari runs on, um, they will tie back what's the bug report to the CVE. 
So there's now this way to start making a connection between, okay, this patch was for this CVE bug, and this is the one that was named in the wild. So we can start to get more information. Um, so kudos to Apple for doing that. Um, Chromium does a similar thing. Firefox does a similar thing as well. As And so I think each of these incremental baby steps towards more transparency is important because what that means is when, while that information of what's the patch for this in the wild bug um, is not probably useful for the majority of the people on this planet or even the majority of the security industry, what that means for someone like me in my position is then I can go try to understand the root cause of the bug. I can work to see, was this patch actually complete? Did it just break that exploit they found or does it fix the underlying problem? What other mitigations can we put into play that might fix the whole bug class instead of just the bug? And like, how did this code end up here? Was it, you know, is it legacy? Um, was it a process thing that we could help come up with solutions for to prevent it in the future? Like all of those different things that hopefully as the industry, we can learn from this case of in the wild exploitation to make it that much harder. In the Marty, future. in addition to just the pure volume rising, one of the big trends I've seen over the last three years looking at your spreadsheet is the words memory corruption. Uh, is it memory corruption? How do you describe it? Memory safety, memory, whatever. Memory yeah, corruption. I use memory it's corruption. Like everything's memory corruption. I, mean, I think this year, I think we have one that's a design issue and uh, the rest are all memory corruption issues. I, I think there were, I think it was like 60 something percent were memory corruption this year. Oh no, I'm talking about so. 22 this year, this year, this year. Yeah, this oh, year, this year, I just yes, looked sorry, at 2022. Sorry. My brain was right? on the year. And year. We're at yeah. 15 2022 and I think 14 are memory corruption issues. My point is, since I've been writing about security in, in 2001, I've been writing about the fight to, to mitigate memory corruption issues. It's 2022. This feels like not a tractable problem. They, it feels very much like your spreadsheet is making it very, very clear that this is the number one thing we need to address, uh, 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 mitigating memory corruption issues. When you look at the, the landscape of this issue over the years, this class of uh, vulnerability over the years, it, do you think it's gotten better? Do you feel like we're, this is something that's even fixable without rewriting all code bases? Like Where are we in this battle against memory safety issues? Um, a lot okay, in there because it's like it, 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 it drives me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so you might have to retarget me, but do I think trying to reduce, extinguish memory corruption is a worthy cause that we can actually make well, of progress course it's on? a worthy cause. Yes. Is it doable? Uh, and then why doesn't after twenty years we're still we're still looking at data that says everything is memory corruption? Yeah, I mean, I get frustrated that it's all memory corruption. You want to see new, interesting bug types, you know, people focusing on logic issues and things like that. Do I think things have probably gotten better? I do. Um, but I don't think, you know, 10, 20 years ago, we had the same tracking the ability to find as many memory corruption. We didn't have as many static analysis, automated tools running and finding lots of things. Are we just... Are um, we just generating so, too much code there's just so much yeah. code being generated that at this point it's a numbers game you're just gonna memory corruption issues are just gonna be in every bit of code base going forward and it's not something we can actually fix on the developer side i do think it is something that can be fixed i don't think it will be 100 percent eradicated it's sort of in that hard versus harder um respect and there are some things that i think are exciting and new ideas especially around maybe not getting rid of memory corruption vulnerabilities and making them not exist in code, but making them unexploitable. Because if a vulnerability exists, but no That's one can actually win. exploit it. That's not even a useful, vulnerability. Yeah, like, I mean, yeah, it's not really, like the whole point is we don't want people to be able to hack others, have capabilities, see data they don't. So it's not so much, is there a vulnerability? It's okay, is this vulnerability able to be right. used to harm someone or organization. Um, so like, I mean, obviously I'm going to, I know my team's efforts more than other ones. So that's what I can talk about. But like, I think it's really exciting the work that Samuel um, 
has started to do with the V8 security team, which is the JavaScript engine on Chrome of trying to create um, a heap sandbox. So I think when I was talking to him, like most of the V8 security bugs um, in the wild security box would be, be seen, they would be unable to be exploited um, if the de design makes it into Chrome. And then um, Chrome is also working on um, backup ref pointer, miracle pointer, other things that will make exploitation of memory corruption vulnerabilities harder. And so I think those types of large scale mitigations is really one of the areas that um, will help make existing code um, more robust against memory corruption exploitation. I also think a lot of the work that folks are doing of rewriting new components in Rust and memory safe languages, like as new code, if we're focused on that new code coming in, yeah. um, memory safe, like that's how we keep making progress to the point that, you know, having a useful memory corruption vulnerability is more and more rare and you got to focus on the logic and the design Am I going to look at your spreadsheet in five years and see uh, uh, less memory corruption issues there? Or do you, get, are you, are you really confident and you have a sense of optimism that this, this mitigating it and making it hard to actually, because listen, Microsoft has been trying for this for years and every time they come out with a new mitigation, it gets bypassed, right? And they even removed it out of scope for their bug bounty program because their memory corruption uh, mitigation just doesn't work. It feels like cat and mouse, cat and mouse, cat and mouse, year after year. 100%. But I think the other thing to keep in mind, and it's one of those questions that I just don't know, is again, in our spreadsheet, we're tracking what is detected right. as an industry. And so I think it might be easier to detect memory corruption vulnerabilities and exploits than it is logic ones, because we know these memory corruption vulnerabilities right. have to follow this pattern. So can you, and we have tools like ASAN builds and things like that, which trigger and tell you, oh, there's memory corruption that's happened here. And so that is a big question in my mind of, are there lots of more logic and design vulnerabilities being used? We just don't know how to find but them, right. all of our tools, and our knowledge, exactly. And so that's where one of the questions I have is because, you know, like one of my teammates, James Forshaw, who does so much Windows research, like, Almost all of the bugs he does is and has for years are logic vulnerabilities, not really memory corruption. Um, and so it would make a lot of sense that, you know, other attackers who are not finding vulnerabilities just to report right. them to and the, the vendor. And the prediction um, is that we'll see a lot more of those mem uh, logic design bugs when Rust kind of takes root, right? Yeah. Yeah, because the logic and design bugs, you know, they're they're harder to find in automated means because you don't know exactly what their pattern's always going to look like. They're exploiting a design choice, a logic choice, and thus that's going to look different for each. I want to swing back to the code. transparency issue here, and it ties back to one of your second recommendation, which is calling for vendors and security researchers to share samples, exploit samples, and, ex and uh, exploit descriptions. That stuff is a. I don't know how to explain this, but for the audience, a lot of. APT zero day activity gets found by a threat intel vendor or an anti malware company or an EDR company. And then that becomes a marketing tool that becomes an important kind of, we need to hold this back. So we have this kind of, and that's the reason why these things aren't being shared. What does that look like in your mind? Is there like a best practices piece there that you can, what does that number two recommendation look like to you? Your own company is somewhat guilty of this. You kind of leave us in the blind saying there's this amazing, amazing maze of zero day activity and multiple amazing things. Your, your door is wide open and good luck. So, right. So what does that look like? So I would not say that that's the commentary first off that, you know, that's Chrome my commentary and uh, Android are saying, I think they're giving us the information of, Hey, this was not just given by a researcher, but there was some reason we are saying it's in the wild. No, no, no. I'm talking about something like even one of the projects, project, project oh, okay. zero, like say, let's say the project zero citizen lab thing. There's no exploits for that. You guys told me that there's this freaking most badass exploit you've ever seen. Yet. What and the rest of us, we just kind of like, okay, we just have to hope that our phone isn't targeted. Yeah. And so I think it's hard. And that's where Project Zero, I think even in our blog post, we admitted we were like, we have not quite figured out, you know, the perfect answers to these questions because there's 
each case is it because of NDAs? Help help the audience understand no. what blocks that. So one, it's if we do look at the tracking spreadsheet, we will see that lots of these zero days to all different vendors are reported anonymously. And so what I would take from that is that if someone's reporting it anonymously, then there's a reason behind that. And also that might mean there's more considerations of they there's reasons why they can't necessarily come out and say like, here's the exploit um, sample, um, you know, or, even whether it would be so it's it's probably tied up in some negotiations it can be tied up in negotiations yeah. where you know whoever the source of it it might get reported from a cert somewhere that says no details to be shared here's here's this exploit no details to be shared yeah. like there's a lot of that yeah and even like in the case of if someone shares a sample with you and like i'm really thankful when folks have allowed us to publish the technical details so at least the technical details are out there and we can still work to provide um suggestions for de defenses and mitigations and things like that um that it's not your choice as the person who it was shared with whether right, the rights to that data still belongs to your source right yeah and you want to but, but so what you're arguing here what you're arguing here is for your source to change his mindset right i mean not necessarily your source but sources in general to change their mindset around allowing the sharing of these so i i don't feel confident saying that either because I don't know, you know, the details behind whatever sources or how zero days may come to be. And that we need to remember when zero day exploits are being used, that this is not just some malware sample you found on virus total, like people's physical safety has been harmed with the use of zero days. These zero days can mean a whole lot to the people who have them. And so I don't think it's fair for me from my, you know, home office sitting here safe and sound to be able to tell someone what will or will not, um, what risks they should be willing to take because I want to be able to see the sample. And, but at the same time, I put that recommendation out there because I do think there's so much from the industry that we can learn from these samples and that trying to- It's lean, a major dark spot. It's a major dark yeah, spot. Yeah, and trying to lean further into default behavior is sharing and it's the exception when they can't be shared publicly rather than I think where the industry is right now is the default is not to share and the exception is when we think there is little risk and things can be shared. So that's what I'm hoping to push for. Um, and that in the meantime, like if people are still feeling scared and hesitant and worried about sharing the sample, then maybe they can share the sample with orgs like myself or other research organizations, threat intel teams who will write up the detailed technical aspects. Because one of the biggest reasons I care about these samples as well is that when you're using a zero day exploit, there's really two parts to it. Yes, there is the vulnerability, but there's also the way that they go about and make that vulnerability useful. So what I call the exploit method or the exploitation technique. And so it's not just about p patching that vulnerability. If we can break the exploit method, then we made it harder too. But without exploit samples, there's no way for us to know even what that exploitation method was. So I think being able to, if orgs can at the very least start publishing, you know, more technical details this year. That's the first step, baby step. And hopefully people will see, okay, the world did not come crashing down. Like things are okay. Let's start, you know, sharing right. more samples. I think that could be a path um, for us all to move more towards the default of transparency around these samples. It feels very weird to me because I agree with you that there, there are improvements. Those, even those one-liners in the Apple advisories, I'll take it. I'll take a line that says it may have been exploited uh, prior to the, whatever they say, it's an yeah. improvement. But at the same time, I look at Microsoft's documentation over the years and it seems to be going backwards. It seems to, okay. there's a lot of companies are not as upfront and descriptive about vulnerabilities like that, than they used to. And that's a dark pattern that's noticeable. Uh, we don't, we're running out of time, but I, I, I can't let you go without asking about the biggest part of your job. It's not only that, it's the root cause analyses that you guys publish, which I really, really enjoy, uh, which is really delving, picking, picking like a really good thing and delving into why you think it happened and making these specific recommendations. You mentioned it early in the pod. When you, based on all the root uh, RCAs you've done, are you spotting any sort of significant 
interesting trend around development, software development that is worth pointing out from the RCAs that you've done? The thing that I see is the biggest trend from year in review 2020, year in review 2021, and so far into 2022 is not only do these bug patterns and the components being targeted look similar to public security research and previous bugs we've seen, but they're actually often variants or bad fixes of previous. Right. That's a big, big, big trend. It's like a, a lot of the fixing isn't complete. Yeah. And as someone in the security industry, I understand sort of why, like, Platform and vendor security teams are so under-resourced and fixing patches and triaging vulnerabilities is not something like the industry, tech industry, industry generally rewards in terms of promotion. It's a crappiest job right? too. Yeah. And it's so like, job. Yeah. yeah. And it's a really hard, like, it's a hard job. So I can't come in and say, vendors, this is how you fix this. But I think it's something we really need to take a look at of okay, so we're seeing this even when the original bug was, say, an in the wild zero day, the fact that a couple months later, that patch wasn't even completely fixed, and now the attackers are back and exploiting it just by this little change to their code. I think that's something we really need to focus on because we're not capitalizing on the fact that we've caught one. We can see what they've done. We can see what they know and fix it so they can't get back in. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing is these is just – good patching, good mitigation, um, the basics. You got to do well at the basics first. You guys are giving, you guys are giving the skeptic too much, too much. I, it's just, it feels like there's just so much, um, so much room for pessimism uh, with where things are. But I, I think the work that you guys are doing is among the most important work. We haven't talked about one day and we haven't, there's a lot of things to talk about still in this thing. So Mari, come back anytime you feel like there's a comeback. Next year, hopefully when we have this conversation in, let's say, five years, these numbers are trending in, in a better direction. Yeah. And I mean, I know you're saying this is all giving you reason to be pessimistic, but it's all it's giving me reason to be optimistic. There's things we can do um, and things that even the industry has done to take those baby steps. So I'm hopeful. All right. Let's leave it right there. Thank you very much, Maddie. Thank you. Thank you.